Greetings, and welcome back to the Rose Bros Podcast. This episode, we are joined by Bruce Murray, CEO and CIO of the Murray Wealth Group. Prior to launching the Murray Wealth Group in 2015, Bruce spent 25 years at McLean Budden as an Executive Vice President and Managing Director. He was one of the key portfolio managers of the Canadian Equity Growth Fund, the American Equity Fund, the International Equity Fund, and the Global Equity Growth Fund. In total, Bruce helped to grow McLean Button's equity portfolios to around $30 billion in assets under management from 1990 until its sale to MFS Investment Management in 2011. Prior to McLean Button, Bruce was Vice President and Equity Analyst at Nesbitt Thompson from 1985 to 1990, where he achieved top rank as a Special Situations Analyst in the Brennan Wood International Survey of Institutional Investors. Bruce started his investment career in 1976 at Crown Life Insurance Company in Toronto as an international economist and financial services analyst. Among other things, we sat down and discussed 40 years on Bay Street and a few of the lessons learned along the way. Also, apologies in advance. The conversation picked up a rogue audio wave while we were recording a few times, but you should be able to hear the conversation just fine. Enjoy. This podcast episode is sponsored by Conate Water Solutions. Do you need cost-effective water sourcing options to supply your next drilling or completions program? Conate Water Solutions is a specialized hydrogeology company focused on water well drilling, testing, and water management services in Western Canada and Texas. Contact info at conatewater.com or check out conatewater.com for more details. This podcast is sponsored by headracingcanada.com. Looking for high-performance ski gear this winter? In partnership with four-time Olympian Manny Osborne Parody, HeadRacingCanada.com is offering the lowest prices possible through its online storefront by passing brick-and-mortar savings on to customers. Check out HeadRacingCanada.com for more info and get your high-performance ski gear for the upcoming season. Okay, why don't we begin? All right, go right ahead. Bruce Murray, thank you very much for doing this. You're quite welcome. I really appreciate your time. You are the CEO and CIO of Murray Wealth Management. For the listener, what is Murray Wealth Management? So Murray Murray Wealth Group, actually is the name of the firm, is a investment manager. Uh, We focus currently on private clients. We're trying to be a one-stop shop for the average Canadian, give them exposure to global equities through one fund. Uh, the average global equity fund sold in the market by the big firms would have 3% Canada. We think this is not appropriate to have somebody in two or three funds. They need a, a global fund. They need a U.S. fund. We just have one fund that uh, has about a 20 to 25% Canadian content in it to get the Canadian flavor. The rest of the Portfolio is made up of leading global companies, and we own companies like Starbucks, Nike, Alphabet, or Google, as it's more commonly known, Facebook and Meta are in the portfolio, but we also own leading companies like Boston Scientific. Uh, we own BMW, for those of you who are auto enthusiasts. So we've got about 25 global companies, and uh, we try to focus on companies that are growing faster than the economy. Therefore, over time, longer time period, stock companies are growing faster than the economy. Stocks will outperform the stock market is the simple basis of it. And we've been running on this philosophy for a good 35 years. You know, it's worked over time continuously. To set the scene here, we are on Bay Street at the moment in your office. You've been on Bay Street for roughly 40 years, I think it is. Yeah, 1976. Yeah, maybe closer to 45 or 50. Yeah, it's a tough business. You know, it's uh, the casualty rate of working on Bay Street is pretty high. How'd you get into investing? Why Bay Street? When I was a kid, my dad had some stocks. And I remember actually, I think it was six or seven, sitting on his knee and the stocks were going down. I could feel the fear in them. And something in me sort of said, maybe I can help dad learn about this. I got to figure this out to help my dad out. And I got into it and so I was buying, I started buying stock. I bought my first stock was in grade seven, I think. Yeah, well, how we started and yeah, and then I got interested. I've been doing it ever since. Mm-hmm. Um, Toronto, always? I grew up in, I went to University of Waterloo. Uh, I lived, grew up in 60 miles west of Toronto in a small town called Paris, Ontario. Just did a brief stint in Ottawa as a civil servant right out of the university. Investing style. Did you have one along the way? Were you uh... well? I th- over the years, we merged into what would be called a growth fund, a growth style. We focus on 
there's two styles. There's value, which you go and you look for companies that are undervalued, a lot of accounting measures. A growth fund, you look at, um, you know, a company like Starbucks is 200 restaurant or stores to open in China, the things like that. And so they've got a big runway in front of them. You, you often pay more for those stocks, but usually they deliver more in the, on a longer term basis. The uh, value style is you often, you know, the company's going downhill for reasons and those reasons often don't turn around. Why wealth management? Did you see a business opportunity? Did you? I just enjoyed it. It's what I want to do. It was tremendously interesting. I mean, most people running corporations are pretty intelligent people. I was usually very enjoyable to talk to them. You learn a lot. I'm very curious. One of my former colleagues used to call me Curious George because I would try and dig into all the corners, find what's driving companies. Mm -hmm. Like we said, you've been on Bay Street for a long time, roughly 40 years. You've seen a lot of business leaders, investors, et cetera, come and go. Are there any that stick out to you? Yeah, better but, than the rest? I mean, I mean, I've met some famous, I mean, a lot of famous investors. I've never met Warren Buffett, but I mean, I've met a lot of the other characters in the business and there's a, a, many interesting ones. Some were good, some were actually criminals. You know, they were, they were famous, but they were actually the Bernie Madoffs world. I never met Bernie, but uh, you know, that type of, uh, those, those people are around. Anyone that stands out? Many stand out. Some were quirky, like Ira Gluskin, carved out a bit of a reputation in Canada at one point in time. Uh, a lot in New York, who I you know had the occasion to meet sort of briefly for a time period. So, I don't envy any of them. If that's for me. I, uh, there are other people in the business, yeah. There's been a lot of ups and downs on Bay Street in the markets over the years. In terms of tough times, was there a crisis that sticks out to you in terms of Oh, all the crises stick out. The worst one was the day uh, Pierre Trudeau declared the national energy policy. You know, Canada was an energy, the Canadian stock market was an energy intensive index. So it was the worst for me. It also was the first one I saw, really. The, why The 70s were tough. There were some, a lot of ups and downs, but there's a lot of volatility. So you could make money trading the vol, make money trading the volatility. And a lot of companies were, were emerging. That was the days of coming out of the nifty 50. Like a, you could buy a company like IBM and it, sailed through a lot of this stuff. Um, there was uh, consumer brands emerging and things like that at the time. Um, Pepsi, Cola was starting to buy this, you know, the Frito-Lay business and, and grow into a global company. So there, I remember we did a comparison. Morning cereals were still, everybody was having cereal in the morning. And so we did a big comparison, General Mills and Kellogg's and things like that. So, so there was that crisis and there was uh 1990 in Canada, we raised interest rates for the inflation that didn't ever did come and housing prices got cut in half and took them 15 years to come back. It was two th mid 2000 before they came back. The 2000 technology bubble, we had that one was, wasn't bad because we had it figured out. We, it was, we actually almost knew it was going to happen and we did very well through that. And then 2008, I wasn't really paying attention to financial stocks. I was working on a big team by that time and um, our financial analysts didn't deliver didn't give us any material they failed in their job let's put it that way and uh so as a portfolio manager i got caught because i didn't have a, a section of the market i was trusting of somebody to do the work on uh, didn't get delivered so that was a tough one as well but we can't we bounce back from them all you had a previous wealth management company before Murray Wealth. I'm correct. um i was a partner in a very successful firm called mclean button and I joined that in 1990 and it was a small company and we made it uh, by 2000 and probably f mid 2000s. We were running, I was running the largest equity fund in Canada of other than sort of a government, it's like a teachers, or, I don't know what the size of their equity funds were, but we had about, we had about $25 billion under management in, in Canadian equities at that time. I went there in 1990 and we hit it off. I hit it off with a couple of older guys who both unfortunately passed away. And we finished first in Canadian equities in 94, 96, 97. We had the best track record in U.S. equities on the face of the earth by, by 2000. And the money poured in. Did you have any idea how well it was going to go? <laughs> I was happy to have a, happy to have a job with some interesting guys and just, I enjoy the life. So that was it. Yeah. Opportunity knocks. Sometimes the door of opportunity opens in life. Mm -hmm. Would yeah. that be one of those moments? Well, I mean, 
every opportunity that opened for me was forced on me. I was the two prior companies I worked for. Uh, one was a life insurance company that went broke and we lost our jobs. The other time I was working as an analyst at a, that's what's now BMO Capital Markets. I got a very unfortunate quote of the day in the Globe and Mail. I said something that they didn't like about one of the companies we were trying to underwrite. I was correct. It went broke, but uh, they didn't like it. And I got let go at noon hour that day. And uh, yeah, but both times, both times I got a better job and it hurt badly at the time. Gee, you know, what am I going to do? Phone my dad, go sell a house and move in with you guys. <laughs> you know? But anyway, it all worked out and it worked out spectacularly at the end. So the doors have closed. Do you think they've opened up into new opportunities at the end of the day? Well, in my case, they did for sure. Yeah. I mean, I went from you know being a, an average white collar worker in a, an insurance company where I would have happily stayed my entire life. You know, I was happy. I'd had a nice pension plan into, uh, you know, having a really exciting career. On the flip side, do you remember when you should have taken an opportunity or do you look back on an opportunity? That you um, well, the only opportunity I took that I shouldn't have taken was I worked for the government of Canada for two years because I was, I, you know, I grew up in a small town and get a government job, you're set for life. And I w went, so off I went to Ottawa after university for two years and it was, uh, m the work was mind numbing, let's put it that way. And so I scoured the Globe and Mail for jobs every day. And in those days, the Globe and Mail business section had a career section that was pages thick. And that's how I found the job with a life insurance company. The worst crisis you may have seen was the energy crisis, 1980. With Pierre that was my worst personal one for me. Yeah, I mean, the 2008 one was the worst crisis for the world because, you know, a lot, it was, it wasn't excess. It was, you know, a lot of people were badly damaged by, you know, had more people didn't know better, got pushed out of their houses on as they'd been coerced into taking a, a, a bad mortgage. So I think that was probably the worst one for people. Um, the 1970s was bad because of inflation, but that was, a, my salary went from 5000 to $40,000 in about three years uh, because of inflation. It wasn't things like that. So if you were young and didn't own any assets, it doesn't, inflation really doesn't hurt you, right? So... From an Eastern perspective, you're from Toronto, mm -hmm. from Calgary, you have a lot of energy guests on the podcast, and know mm -hmm. that world pretty well. But from your perspective, I guess, what was the National Energy Program and why was it so bad? Oh, it was, um, this is a Toronto uh, perspective. As an analyst, or, or I guess, knowing the industry, I mean, it was internal politics, federal versus provincial government. It was the fact that uh, the inflationary times were causing tough times, Ontario was suffering, um, Ontario went through a rough time in the late 60s, 70s, uh, the big manu a lot of the big manufacturing got globalized, uh, the unions had pushed wages beyond what the companies were prepared to pay and they moved to, you know, close your plant in Canada and move to Mexico, move to even, you know, things like that. When we went, when the free trade agreement came in, it really took out some more of that, took out the rest of that, but it was well on the way and free trade actually is better in the longer term. but. So you had uh, the East was suffering and the West, because of higher energy prices, was was wealthy. And I think it was just, uh, you know, governments doing as governments do. They want to get votes and there's more votes. There are more votes in the East. So they, Saudi Arabia was the evil enemy and stuff like that at the time. They, I remember that nobody could drive because you couldn't afford gasoline. I mean, gasoline cost more. Gasoline to drive to work cost more and you made it work for a, for a period in there. Stuff like that. So I think that's what it was. And I mean, again, we're seeing again, uh, you know, liberals are, they get pushed towards socialism when uh, the NDP is strong, like right now. We're seeing it again. So, I mean, it's the politics of Canada. From the perspective of someone out west, you might think it's kind of an east-west thing. But in fact, it's a little more nuanced where there are pockets within Toronto, for instance, that do sympathize with the Western. Well, I mean, areas. I think, um, yeah, I was making, I bought my first house on street oil energy stocks. Yeah. So, I mean, the national energy policy was a massive way. We, we bought out a lot of uh, foreign companies at a hundred dollar oil in 1979, 80 when, you know, oil has rarely been to a hundred dollars. And so the cost and interest rates are 20 percent. So, I mean, we we're pay we paid thousands of dollars a barrel for oil, so it was a it was a tremendous uh, burden on the country that uh, national energy policy and you know, government should stay out of business. You know, tax it if you want. Taking it over and creating never works. 
rarely works. I mean, look at look at Russia. I mean, it was a, uh, everything was government controlled, and it doesn't work. It can work short time when you get maybe in the initial stages of of a you know workers' paradise. Everybody's buys in, but over time, it becomes corrupt quickly. How prevalent do you think that viewpoint is? is Eastern Canada, Toronto, Ottawa, are you a lone wolf in that thinking? <laughs> oh, no, I'm not lone at all. I mean, right now, I'm actually kind of more concerned because the I think the Conservative Party has got too much of the Donald Trump stuff in it. And I mean, O'Toole could have won the last election if he just supported vaccines, but he he wouldn't stand up because of the fringe element on the far right of the uh, conservative party that uh, was anti-vaccine or anti this and the truckers protests. I mean, you know, ninety percent of people in the country were vaccinated, so ninety percent of the people were in favor. And you don't turn around and say you don't turn around and not support ninety if you expect to win the election. You're supporting the six or seven percent of the people. I think uh, the Republican Party in, in the U.S. and the Conservative Party have to go through. You have to, there's got to be some sort of crisis here to bring them back to. The, the center. I mean, they're, they're on the extreme edge, and that's allowed the you know the NDP minority has pushed their whatever their normal rate. Is. You know, they're probably operating now at sort of double their 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 franchise, right? Because uh, they've got the Trudeau needs them to. Is that an uncommon point of view in Toronto? Or I don't think so. I think the I think the silent majority is on side with that. This isn't a political podcast. Well, anyway, anyway uh, <laughs> politics gets into everything. It does, yeah. I mean, in investing, politics are the ground rules. Like, you know, you can go invest in China and make a lot of money, but there's just a, there's a bigger chance to steal it from you than, you know, ethics are. I've learned enough about Asia that ethics are different and you be very careful when you invest there. There was a company I followed that was owned by some Indians at one time. This is 30 years, 35 years ago. And I was an analyst following this company and they had a great little business. But they just decided uh, they'd take all the minority shareholders' money too in a deal. And they just, I don't even know if it was legal, but they, they basically took it off themselves and just left everybody else to dry, hung them out. So, yeah, so, uh, yeah, you, you have to be extremely conscious of the ethics of people when you're investing. With them. In terms of investing, you've been doing it for a long time. Do you have maybe a brief checklist in terms of what you're looking for in a company? Is it management? I mean, Is it look for management that's enthusiastic about what they're doing. If they're enthusiastic and they're excited about what they're doing, they tell you that what they're doing and they sound enthusiastic about it versus um, their people, well, I'm in this to get rich. When you hear that, okay, they're looking after themselves, not after you. I mean, those, those are exaggerations, but that's, you have to be conscious of the world around you. Like, where's the world going? Like, if you go back to the 60s and 70s, you know, TV was the, was sort of the new thing and and those those companies were doing really well. Now, TV is disappearing. Look at lots of businesses. Uh, you know, we've had tremendous transformation in, the, in in our world. I think it's going to continue. Just at a luncheon where we're talking about robotic surgery, like robots can do a better job of surgery than a skilled physician. And so, you know, things like that are happening. And so you, you want to stay, uh, there's the bleeding edge of technology and leading edge of technology. And a lot of, there's often too much enthusiasm for popular things like, um, like we're just now going through suffering on the overinvestment in green energy. Like there's a lot of green energy. Cannabis was another one where uh, we saw a lot of enthusiasm for it. And, but the action, it was way overestimated the penetration was going to be same with green energy how quickly it would come in how effective it was going to be things like that so you have to be you have to be aware of them but be careful of them at the same time you know and which one's a real opportunity I've had a successful career looking back it's easy to draw the line of success going one way but if you look back on things do you remember time when things may not have worked out so well or oh sure i mean uh, i've uh <laughs> Supporting a company that uh, had fraud in it at one point in time and bankruptcy and uh, it was interesting. It was, uh, I won't name the company, I won't not name the people, but the guy had a, a vision of where credit cards and money was going to go. And every, like today's, he could forecast today's world where there's no, where virtually no cash. Cash was unnecessary and he could tell you how to get there, but he was a fraud. Like, he knew he couldn't implement it, right? And he, she, I remember I phoned him up after and said, why did you do that? Because the only fraud was on the balance sheet. He created 
the company be more successful than it was? And then he said, well, you know, all the analysts were saying, I'm going to grow 20%. I was only really going to grow 10%. So I created the 20, the 10, and, you know, he didn't have to do that. He would have got there, but he, he knew where to go and how to go there, but he, his ego wouldn't let him. So, you know, stuff like that. And so, I mean, that was a very hard time because there's a lot of people who had bought into the story. I could see where it was and I'd question them on these things. And I even phoned up, um, they'd one of the big auditing firms. I even phoned up the auditor and said, what do these, are these numbers real? And like that. And, oh yeah, they're all like Keith. He said, I stand behind everything that's in that statement. And, you know, he didn't go to jail. I think this firm paid a fine, but auditors can be tricked as well. So, I mean, it's, and they're paid by the company. So it's. What happens to guys like that? Do you see them uh, downtown? <laughs> I only talked to the guy on the phone. I don't, I wouldn't, couldn't have picked him up a lineup. I would imagine he was quietly, well, no, I think he, well, he was working for a account, big accounting firm. I imagine he was quietly told to go away and retire early or, you know, I suspect he, you know, he'd be an embarrassment to the firm. So I expect they dealt with him in some way. How do you navigate tough times? Um, do you run lots? Do you exercise? Do you go to the mountains? How have you managed 40 years on May Street? Oh, I enjoy it. So it's not a problem. I mean, even the tough times, there's always oh, more opportunity in tough times. Like it's where you find real, real opportunity. So, uh, yeah, I mean, I think exercise, not letting it bother you too much are the things you have to do. I mean, I guess, yeah, I have stress over it for sure. And I have stress every day. I mean, I manage other people's money and, you know, I, when I lose the money, I, you know, I you feel awful. I just feel awful. So, cause you're here to, help them not not hinder them and you know so when 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 it doesn't work i mean I'm, you've been on Bay street for a long time so you've lasted but a lot of people come and go what percentage oh it's i mean my career um of the guys i started with probably 50 percent were gone in the first five years 80 percent were gone in 10 years 90 percent are gone and i mean of the guys i started with at the life insurance company well one guy's done very well and I, they're probably, we probably went to 35, 40 people there. One guy, one other guy's done real well and still around. And two other guys had a career. Like they were, they made it to 55 or 60 and the rest of them were, I mean, it's a brutal business. It's pure capitalism. If you're not, if you're not carrying your weight, you, you're chopped down and gone. So do you recognize anyone when you walk down the street these days? I still recognize a lot of people. Yeah. Yeah. People recognize me. I had a sitting beside a young analyst this morning, and I said, "Oh, I mentioned a sales a salesman. I knew there. I'm sitting beside this guy. Oh, he's a legend. So I've been called a legend, superstar. So yeah, it's it's, it's flattering sometimes, even though I don't believe those. You know, I, I don't see myself in those lines, but I've been called those things. So sometimes it's easy to explain to people what you should do and what leads to success, mm -hmm. and give prescriptions, but. Oftentimes, in the words of, say, Charlie Munger, it's easy to say what to avoid mm -hmm. in order to have a successful career. Did you avoid anything in three yeah. years? I mean, the worst things for career are excess ego. I'm smart and you, uh, bullying, treat people the way you want to be treated as the way to do it. Um, the worst thing I see is people, you know, they get some money and they spend it ridiculously and you know, and then they they weren't as good as they thought as they thought they were, and they lose their job, and you know they're in a crisis, and they're trying. To, I've had people who should have had enough money to live a very nice life come try and borrow from me, and they're fifty five or sixty. Like it doesn't. You know, you should have saved hundreds of thousands of dollars by now with the life you with the job you had and the life you led. And they're usually wearing. You know, they've got the fancy gold watch and. They're driving a fancy car and, you know, you find, and then you realize it's all, they're living on credit and it's just a shell. And, and when it crumbles, it just crashes and they hurt their families, their children, their friends, you know, and stay, live within your means always and never get too um, cocky about yourself. We're all people who come and go. I always t tell people, you know, name the richest guy in Rome. The poets are are still known. Yeah, for sure. The political, you know, the the, mili the, the military generals, but who's the richest? Who's the richest guy? Richest merchant in Barcelona in fourteen hundred? Maybe you could find out. You probably couldn't even dig it up, and it probably isn't even in the history books, right? So, people in Bay Street are not historically important in a sense. Even the emperors of Rome, you know, there are probably two hundred emperors of Rome over this. 
probably probably more than that. Five hundred years is probably, you know, <laughs> several hundred, and, and five or six are really known, right? So yeah, yeah. Through the years, was there a business that really stuck out to you that was unbelievable, that made the most money, had the best? Well, I mean, I mean, the cyclical businesses like oil and gas mining are amazing because they're either really profitable or really unprofitable, and there's you know, and they go boom, and they go, and then they come roaring back. Um, so if you can live with the volatility and, you're, and have some confidence, you can call those uh, cycles. You can make a lot of money catching uh, a company that, like you had bought Facebook or Google when they first came public, uh, Microsoft, and ride those. I mean, even, you know, Starbucks and Nike. I mean, if you bought Nike, who would have thought buying a running shoe company, you're going to set the world on fire, right? Uh, so, I mean, if you can... Find identify talented leaders who have a vision and and can deliver. You can and staying with it. I mean, like let's say you bought Microsoft when it came public in nineteen ninety two. I think it came public. I mean, they probably made ten thousand times on your money, but very few people do that. They make they double their money. Hey, hey double money is selling their stock, right? So, yeah. Was your favorite time in your career? Most stimulating, most exciting? Oh, the most exciting time was the... Maybe right now. In, <laughs> well, I mean, I enjoy right now. I think the most exciting time was when McLean Budden became successful. We were, our salesmen were, oh, you want to give us $100 million for the pension plan? You know, oh, it's the teachers of, you know, Nova Scotia. We'd like you to manage our pension plan. You know, just very rewarding time in that time. So that was mm -hmm. exciting. I mean, it was exciting... Uh, Exciting starting this business was exciting. The payoff is probably still down the road, but uh, really just working. We've got about 100 families working right now. The really reward is uh, helping them make a, make a fair bit of money, hopefully. In your opinion, what makes a good wealth management? Oh, I mean, a good wealth management company, again, has the interest. Of, it's like any business. You have to have your client's interests. This is the most important thing. And then you have to fulfill the expect of you. Our job is to edge, is to deliver superior long-term results to people, but it's also educating them that like, I still have a lot of clients who are, you know, the market's up. Did I make any money? Should I sell? Market's down. I'm, you know, it's half of them are, half of, some people say, should I buy? And other people say, market's down, it's going to get worse. You know, it's, it's, it's like, it's, it's uh, trying to hopefully tell people, you know, go about what you enjoy. Don't worry about this. We'll take care of it for you. as well. Uh, you know, educating them on stuff. So we do a lot of, we try and publish a lot of stuff on companies. And we focus not on the market. We focus on companies. So we try to find good companies that are going to deliver what we want our clients to have or pay dividends, whatever the, we've got two funds. We've got a dividend fund for, you know, somebody who's retired and, and wants to live off income. We try and keep the payout. We try to find companies with fat dividends that are rising. And when you do that, often you, and we try to keep a, or at the moment, we're trying to keep like a five or six percent yield in the fund, and often when you buy stocks of five and six percent yields, they are down for some reason. It's maybe not right, and all of a sudden the the stocks double the yields three percent. So we sell them and buy something else. We try, but and therefore we can gradually build the income that our our clients receive. That's it. And then for you know somebody who's young, putting away for you know if you're sub fifty five or sub sixty, even you know our global equity fund should outperform because we're buying better quality companies and the dividends has companies like the Canadian banks. They're they're great companies, but Microsoft's gonna make you more money over five or ten years than Bank of Nova Scotia. So um but it's not gonna pay you the dividends you need to live. So that's sort of the two philosophies of the firm. In terms of dividends, what's your perspective from the East on the current dividend rates being paid out in the energy sector right now? So I'm approaching ten percent. Um, Does that worry you? Are you happy? I it's uh I'm Have you we seen own this some and we've done <laughs> and we've um I mean Have you seen this before? Not we haven't seen the energy companies paying out big dividends before. This is the first time. Uh historically, you know, they wanted to increase their reserves. They spent money, you know, when they made money, they chased more reserves. Um I think given the world we live in now, there's there's two things going on. Number one, there's all this talk about, you know, energy demand is, or fossil fuel demand has peaked. Uh, we're going to move away from that. And so you've got a top-down vision saying, don't, don't, we don't need you to go and triple your reserves. And on the other hand, um, 
even if you find oil and gas in Canada, it's tough to sell. It would, you know, what do you get? A twenty dollar discount on Canadian crude by the time it gets to Texas. One of the things I would I'm critical of is the fact we didn't build pipelines. I mean, we had the opportunity to build some pipelines that would have exported crude. And I mean, and uh, you know, the the environmentalists say we shut down um, you know, we green, we stopped this stuff. Well, we also enabled uh Vladimir Putin. He oh, you don't want to build those things? I'll build them. And his 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 energy infrastructure to export is far more environmentally dangerous than ours. And look at what he used the money to do. I mean, each one of those pipelines would have been a thousand dollars of GDP per capita, so the country would have been wealthier, and maybe would have had the money to move to green energy faster or to do things like that. So, I think there was a. I think that's the difference. And so the companies now are saying, well, you know, we've got some good cash coming through right now with the current price. Our ability to really expand, we can't really sell it if we do it, get it more. So, let's just focus on what we can do and uh, pay it out. So I think that's the difference this time. Does that attract money from the East? Does that? Oh, for sure. I mean, look at BNN. Every every time I'm on BNN, I get a ton of energy questions and they come from all over the country. I mean, private investors uh, love gold mines. They love oil because you'll find the big one and the, you know, my penny stock into a a $10 stock and I get rich. It's a bit of a, there's a bit of a lottery feeling in that also people like dividends too they like that yeah well yeah but i mean and uh you know coming you know, in every month well i think it also say i mean the canadian energy industry really started you know, somewhat new i mean it really blossomed in the 70s was the first and so you had a generation of leaders at that time who you know they wouldn't just take raw land and found and created wealth and they that's what we do and they kept doing it now you've got a generation of leaders who are looking at a more mature industry and so i think the Probably the the industry is growing with as it's aged, it's become it's given the management that's required or the management that it needs. I mean, Canadian Natural Resources was uh, you know the first one in sort of the after coming out of the nineteen seventies crisis to focus on a, on on long term corporate value rather than just going out and finding more oil and gas. And I think that set the tone for the industry. Did you ever meet Murray? I sat beside Murray. Yeah, I, when you're the biggest shareholder of a company, you get to, in my days of McLean Button, we were the biggest shareholder. If we owned a company, we were the biggest shareholder. I got to meet everybody. Yeah, yeah. Mm-hmm. The economy now. Do we need higher interest rates? I think uh, you could look at the current situation as when COVID struck, it sh- shut down so much of the economy, and we're still trying to reopen it, right? And so you've got an economic philosophy where demand's two feet wide. And supply is a foot and a half wide, right? And so you've got, well, we've, let's use the auto industry, for example. You know, we were used to produce, North America, we just used number of weeks, we'd bounce between 16 and 17, 18 million units. And all of a sudden, we only produced 14 for two years and demand didn't go down. And so the price of used cars and everything rose to, as the law of economy. And now, as the chip shortages and stuff are being, you know, the the production's increasing, but we've still got another year and a half to two years of just to catch up on inventory. Raising interest rates is that, oh, demand exceeds supply. And uh, demand is normal, but supply is depressed. So we're going to hammer demand down to the level of supply. Whereas I truly believe they would have been better off if they had... Um, if they'd raised rates a little, not nearly as aggressively to slow, slow, try to slow demand down a bit, but just say, you know, we're going to have higher interest rates for a year and a half, two years, higher inflation until dem- supply can catch back up to where demand is. And I think it would have been a more gentle process and less violent. But at the same time, we'd lowered interest rates too much at the beginning of the pandemic. We threw too much money to everybody in hindsight. Yes. I mean, at the time, we didn't know it was uh, something new and we'd never seen it before. So it's, I don't like to criticize people, but I think that's, but I, but I, I do believe, I do believe that they raised interest rates way too aggressively. And, uh, they should have, you know, they're basically zero, right? And now they're, you know, we're almost at 5%. If they just take them back to two and a half or 3%, it probably could have lived, but, you know, inflation may have lasted a little bit longer, but it probably would have been gentler on the economy. Who knows? I mean, and politics have big play in in central bank authority. So uh, 
George Bush um, the first got couldn't get reelected, even though he's a, probably a pretty good president, because you know it's, there's a story. It's the economy, stupid, you know. And so, I mean, if we cause a recession, it won't well, it won't be good for Biden. I don't know what the Republicans are going to put to, forward in the next election, but you know, we're basically a year and a half away from that. You know, late 2024 is uh, when this stuff will all be around. So uh, uh, there's a good chance Biden doesn't win because we have a we're in a we're in a recession caused by these higher interest rates this time. And so yeah, there are there are some rare ramifications of it. That, but on the other hand, we've raised. Uh, we raised interest rates till we broke something with these big with these bank failures and stuff that they've triggered, and um, that probably will cause them to slow their rates down. But you know, they're also we said we we're going to raise rates, so I'm going to I've got to raise them because I said I was going to. Right, so there's that too. So, do you remember Paul Volcker when you raised the rates? Yeah, do you remember that? Do you remember yeah, well, I mean that was interesting because I remember the terrifying that rates are going to twenty two, twenty three percent, but. That was a different inflation. That was, I mean, as I told you, I think I st started off with five thousand dollar job, a salary in nineteen seventy four, and by you know, I was making seventy thousand by nineteen seventy or something. So I mean, yeah, that wasn't seventy thousand; it was probably forty thousand. You know, so I got an eightfold increase in salary in four years. Like that was inflation. That was true inflation, right? But um, yeah, I don't. I think the inflation this time is very, is much different. In the 70s, it was anticipated that the baby boom entering the labor force would be highly productive and would keep in, and therefore interest rates would be low. But then two things happened. Um, you had the Vietnam War and the hippies. Everybody decided instead of, you know, getting out of high school, getting a job going, or going to college and getting a job, oh, I can go smoke pot in Marrakesh for five years. And so there's a, a gap. And all of a sudden, and then by the time they had entered, the, the majority had entered the labor force in 1980, we finally got the the great productivity that was of this massive labor force coming in and you know, and creating value. And now we're having a bit of the opposite problem. The baby boom is retiring. Many baby boomers only had one or two children. And the, we, so we have to bring in massive immigration to keep the nursing homes as we all get there to, uh, so uh, it's been a bit of a different thing. So hence, interestingly, you know, it's the older people that fight the immigration, yet we need the immigration to pay their their way forward. So it's a You've studied this stuff for a long time. They're complex systems. In your experience, how effective are mon monetary policies when you look back? Well, I think um or is it all in vain? No, no, it's not in vain. Um I mean economics has made massive advances. The nineteen thirties, right? It was a failure a failure yeah. of Understand? We had you know people. Oh, the banks are out of money. Tough luck, right? And all, you're all losing your money. I mean, and money's not a natural thing. Money's a creation of mankind. I think the uh, lessons learned at that time better, much more well thought out system now. But it's still, it is a human thing, and humans make errors, and humans can make massive errors, and so we still have those. But um, 2008, for example, you know, was the scariest time for that. When the U.S. banking system collapsed, it wasn't the economist that saw it. The Treasury Secretary, I can't remember his name, but anyway, he was the guy that went in, you know, an economist can't go into the J.P. Morgan and say, you are going to buy Merrill Lynch right. and you're going to eat it, right? Yeah. Oh, gosh, I think we need to do this, right? Paulson should get the credit for that, not the, not the, not the brain, not like not the PhDs in economics. Paulson was the guy that... The guys, the, you know, the, the PhDs in economics told them what had to be done. He was able to implement it, which is was incredible. I mean, I'm I don't know his education was. He probably had a he probably had a degree in economics himself. But he was he was uh, he he was the guy who realized something had to be had to be done fast and had and he had the power to implement and he did. Versus the 1930s, where oh, okay, I'm not going to buy that. You know, let it go bankrupt, right? And um, so, I think Paulson. Deserves a, a hero's mouth. Yeah. Just read John Galbraith, Short History of Financial Euphoria, all on uh, bubbles. Have you seen that play out numerous times to me? Sure. Account? I mean, like crypto. we've seen it in crypto. We've seen it in cannabis. We saw it in um, oil and gas. We've, people get excited over future stuff. Maybe we're, we're seeing it in green energy. Look at, look at the price Tesla stock got to, right? So it's still very, it's still, 
they've done they've delivered everything you can possibly hope for. The stock's one fifth of what it was, right? So, yeah, it's euphoria over stuff can get carried away. Has it been easier to recognize those hints or clues over the years? Has it gotten easier? Well, when you live one or two, you start to recognize them. Yeah, yeah. I mean, it didn't stop us from not Facebook and Google. We had sold some. We should have sold more, but because they're different, because you can still see the forward story on those stocks. And low interest rates, low interest, I mean, what hurt those stocks was the rise in interest rates more than um, overvaluation on the euphoria of, of their future. You keep interest rates where they are if you're in charge. Well, right now, yeah, I just, I'd let them settle. I'd, I'd leave them here for six months to a year and then lower them. I'd take them back to probably around 3%, probably. Like they want to get, two, they want inflation at 2%. Maybe. Technology is going to unleash massive productivity again, which keeps things down. Uh, I mean, the issues are a shortage of labor. Nobody wants to work in a factory anymore. Nobody wants this sort of stuff. So, um, you know, labor is going. And so, I mean, we're going to see productivity replacing labor. Like, I mean, I've heard now there are McDonald's around where you walk in, you punch your what you want in, and a machine delivers you a bag stapled with your food. I mean, elimination of labor that people really don't want to do. At the, at uh, will be mechanized. Yeah, and we've been through that. I mean, people don't have to sit behind a horse and plow the field anymore, and uh, you don't have to sit beside some dirty piece of noisy machinery and and catch the parts coming out of it. So we made great. That's all progress. But you know, there can be it's disrupted when you lay the guy off who was taking the parts out of the machine. So it's good for humanity, but not necessarily for the for the single guy at the time that it happened. We've seen a lot of innovation, technology come and go. It's, it's easy to see maybe where the trends are coming, but how do you make sure you're investing in a viable business that is on the forefront? Have you learned to develop that insight on the right investments and for the right price? Yeah, I mean, but we wait till it proves it. I mean, uh, there used to be like investing in drugs. Somebody come up with a drug, sounded miraculous. And it was, I mean, it was miraculous, but if you... And the stock would start to rise. But if you wait until the day the FDA actually said, yes, this drug works and people can sell it, stock was probably up a hundredfold already, right? No, it wasn't too late because you'd still get 10 to 12 times as this company rolled out, the drug would carry on, right? You wouldn't make, you know, if you bought 25 speculative drug companies, one might deliver, right? But if you waited till here, you and and you got a blockbuster product you could do that and right now like one of the companies we're looking at is Eli Lilly Eli Lilly like they they're getting drugs now that can cause people to lose massive amounts of weight it'll be block I mean it'll be huge huge drug and Lilly has uh, one uh, right now that's uh, in approval and I think it'll be approved in the next year or so I mean those statistics are good and so I mean. If you wait till that drug gets approved, you probably buy it. Lily's expensive on the basis of the prospect of this drug. But once it gets approved, it'll be more expensive to buy, but it'll be a sure thing. And and you'll be able to... So it depends on what risk you want to take. Investing is all about risk. How much... Do you want to go to the lottery and, you know, a thousand, you know, put a dollar down. A thousand, you're going to put a dollar down. The winner's going to get 500 bucks, right? So half... You're losing half the money is lost, but one person can do well. So, I mean, that's... The lower down into the stock range, the mining and oil and gas, you know, where there's 100 companies, each of them is going to drill one well. Which one's going to hit the best? We don't know, right? So it's the same thing. If you give advice to a young investor, an entrepreneur, business leader, what would you tell them? Invest in what you know and understand. I mean, it's like you know what you're buying, you know what you're enjoying, you know what you like to do, and other people will like it too. So, like, that's simple. If you enjoy wearing a pair of Nike shoes, probably other people are going to enjoy it. And so, uh, you know, that sort of stuff. If you invest in what, you know, um, when Costco came on, people were shopping at Costco. Everybody said, oh, I'm going to go shop. That's great, you know. If you bought Costco stock, you would have done wrong. Same with Walmart when things like that. Mm -hmm. That's a great conversation. If we were to leave it, you haven't had to work for a long time. What motivates you nowadays? What, what motivates me is um, love it. <laughs> it's it's I'm unfortunate to be I mean I mean if you look you look at it another way it's, it, it's a game right I'm good at this game I want to I enjoy winning and I'm going I'm going to keep winning right you you're competing with a lot of the smartest guys and a lot of the top guys of the business schools into this business 
and you're competing with them, 90% of them are going to lose. Yeah. And if you can be in that 10% to win, and I've been fortunate during my career, I've always been there. Doesn't mean I'll stay here, but I believe I, I'm going to I'm going to keep playing the game because I I enjoy it, and I think if you enjoy a game, you get you get good at it. So mm-hmm. I appreciate your time. You're welcome. That Thank you. Great conversation. Good. Thanks for listening, everyone. Hopefully, you enjoyed the episode. If you liked what you heard, check out rosebros.ca where we will have upcoming shows. Until next time, happy coffee drinking. Happy coffee drinking.